In all the hurry and hustle and confusion of modern living, the Lord has a way. We believe the Bible is a revelation of His way. We invite you to join us for In Search of the Lord's Way with Mac Lyon. How good it is, my friend, to welcome you to our Bible study, In Search of the Lord's Way. I pray we'll both be blessed by our study together today. We're closed caption too, you know. The Bible is still atop the best-selling list of books. We would assume from that that it's the most read and best-loved book, too. You see, it's our Maker's Instruction Manual for the family of man. Those who follow its precepts prosper. And remember that uh, prosperity is not always measured in dollars and cents. It's as the first psalm says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Well, it's Father's Day across America. It isn't a biblical holy day. It's a day that we Americans have set aside to remember and pay honor and tribute to our fathers. We've had such a day for mothers for nearly a century now. In more recent years, we've had one for fathers too. Somehow the word father just doesn't carry the tender emotion that the word mother does. It evokes another equally as satisfying sentiment though. It expresses love all right. Yes, of course it does, but it has firmness too, a steadiness, a direction, protectiveness about it. Well, it doesn't say that to everyone maybe. But that'd be the usual, and we don't build our case for anything on exceptions. I hope you honor and father, uh, honor your father in some way today. It'll mean a lot to him. Our program is far and about fathers today. We're giving it the title, Fatherhood is Honorable. We'd like to hear from you. Write us in search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma 73083 or by email at searchtv at aol.com. Or if you prefer, you may talk to some of us toll-free by dialing 1-800-321-8633. You may read the text of this message or hear it, or you may even view the program again on our website, searchtv.org. You see, our programs are presented around the world by radio and TV and Internet without any appeals for money by Churches of Christ working together in unity and love. Visit us soon, will you? Ken Heldbrand is our music director. He's going to lead the Edmund Church of Christ now as we sing together. Then I'll be back for Bible reading and prayer. Our scripture text today is going to be from Ephesians chapter 6 beginning at verse 1 and we'll read through verse 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord for this is right. Honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may be well with thee and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers provoke not your children to wrath but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Read through verse 4. 
Now let us go to God in prayer. Holy Father in heaven, we bow before thee now and pray as we always do in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Today we're especially mindful and grateful to thee for the arrangement of our families, especially for our parents who have given us correction and guidance for a better and to prepare us better for life. They may not have been all that we had hoped that they might be, or they might not have been the kindest as we thought they ought to be on some occasions, and uh, as we would have thought they should be. But we honor them today. We're very grateful for the precious memories that we have of our fathers. Enhance our love and respect for them today, we pray. Amen. Several years ago, after I delivered a series of Sunday morning sermons from our Lord's Great Sermon on the Mount, a very conscientious Christian lady came to me and said in the foyer that the sermons had been more harmful to her than helpful, more discouraging than encouraging. Well, needless to say, such a remark as that came as a shock to me and a disappointment. Because you see, my sole purpose for preaching the series was to inspire and encourage and lift up people to live as Jesus taught. Well, you hear me say it every week, week after week. I believe the Lord's way to live is the best way that's ever been introduced to the family of man. But the good lady saw my disappointment. She explained what she meant. The high standards which Jesus had set for us in his sermon were too high for her. She felt that she could never attain them. Why even try, she asked. Well, since that morning in 1965, I've often wondered if our Lord's teachings would be more encouraging had He set a lower standard for us. I seriously question that, don't you? You may have seen a news story that I saw a while back, the story of the school in California that had lowered the bar in the intramural high jump competition so low that no child was unable to clear it. They didn't want to discourage or humiliate even the poorest jumper. So they just put it down so low that every child could jump over it. Then those supposedly adult teachers wondered why the children lost interest in the contest and just quit. Well, in the same way, had our Lord lowered the standards of His teaching, wouldn't it have been so cheapened that it would have had no meaning and value? Why, certainly so. And that's precisely what's happened in much of American religion of our time. It's an attempt to meet everyone's own personal rights and needs and, well, demands in order to make our Lord's teachings marketable, acceptable with the masses. So many people have assimilated or absorbed so many of the social demands that it's just simply lost its cutting edge. Well, what has all that to do with Father's and Father's Day? It's simply this. The Lord's teaching for and about marriage and the family is high and noble and demanding. It requires genuine love and absolute commitment with patience and faith and effort on the part of every family member to make it work. But it does work and its rewards are all worth the effort required to scale its heights. For people who fear the noble heights of biblical teaching about marriage, sociologists and psychologists continue to look for alternatives in what they call domestic partnerships, in which the man and the woman may live together and have children, but um, may remain fancy free and leave the offspring without, with only one parent 
anytime they find another domestic partner who they think can give them more pleasure. Well, to be frank, that's just a half step. Well, maybe not even that much above the lifestyle of the barnyard animals. It doesn't surprise us because the proponents of such things believe that we are mere animals anyway. Well, such arrangements are only substitutes. And we all know that a substitute is never as good as the genuine of everything. By lowering the standards, we've destroyed the meaning of the family. Unlike any other creature he had made, God made man in his own image. Genesis 1, verses 26 and 27. He made us male and female, man and woman, capable of reproducing, replenishing, or populating the world. Genesis 1, 28. And unlike the other creatures which he had made, he ordained that human reproduction be within marriage, between the married man and woman, who are joined together with one another for life. Genesis 2, 24, Matthew 19, verses 5 and 6. Jesus said that from the beginning it was God's plan for marriage that it be one man and one woman for a lifetime. For that, or from that, we can know that God meant for children to be born and brought up in the home with the, both the biological father and mother. It's just our society has turned away from God to become a secular society. The feminist movements of the last half century or so have devalued father in the American family. They've convinced many men even that they're no longer needed in the family, that mother and the children can do as well without him, perhaps even better, because his presence is actually perceived by them as a threat to them. Consequently, four out of every ten children will go to bed tonight in a home without their biological father. In the 1999 book, The Faith Factor in Fatherhood, edited by Don Eberly, it's noted that Statistics indicate that the greatest predictor of crime in a community is not education or income, but whether or not a child lives with his biological father. So the results of the new fad are really treacherous. It's high time that we turn back to the scripture which says, Honor thy father and mother which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with thee that thou mayest live long on the earth. That's the passage we read a moment ago, Ephesians 6, verses 2 and 3. Both father and mother are told, uh, are, are to be held in honor and respect. It doesn't say to honor them if they're without fault or if they never made a mistake or as long as they approve of our behavior or we approve of theirs. It just says, honor thy father and mother. Well, what honorable and worthy contribution can a father make by his presence in the family? First, he can love his wife and children. Second, only to the Lord, no one else, absolutely no one else, and nothing should come between a man and his wife and children. The scripture says, husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Ephesians 5, 25. The idea is that a husband should love his wife so much that he would die for her if the need arose. The same love should exist between a father and his children. His wife and his children should hear him say it often, I love you, and be assured by his actions that it's sincere. Although we don't talk about it as much, a father's love can be as strong as a mother's love. It's from his father that a young man first learns how to love and respect and treat a woman. Next, father can be the head of his family. 
Modern feminist movements have made light of it, but God still teaches it in Ephesians 5, 23, 24. He says the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let, their wi let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Before he ever proposes marriage, a young man needs to know whether the young lady whose hand he seeks in marriage will abide by that teaching we just read. And before she ever says yes to him, the young lady needs to know whether he's the kind of a man to whom she can be submissive. Failure on the part of either to do so can mean marriage failure. Do they follow the same guide? Are they guided by the same teaching, the Lord's teaching? In spite of all that's said, being said, to the contrary, a woman will have no problem with submissiveness when she's married to the man that's described in the same verses that require her to do so. Father, if he's present in the family circle, can also teach and train and correct or discipline his children and lead them in the right way of the Lord. We read that from Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Don't fight and quarrel with them and make them angry and rebellious, but bring them up in the teaching and the discipline of the Lord. God knew Abraham that he would command his children and his household after him, and they would keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. Genesis 18, 19. I spoke recently, perhaps it was on Mother's Day, I don't remember, about the man in the St. Louis Air Terminal whose son, oh, age three or thereabouts, was already beyond his father's control. Since then, I was preaching at another place, popular vacation spot for a lot of people. And one morning when I came down to the hotel restaurant for bre breakfast, there was a couple with two children, sharp-looking lad who appeared to be about seven and pretty little girl who was, oh, maybe five years old. They ate at the table next to mine, and the children were unusually polite and well-behaved, showing good training at home. But something must have been said or done at their table, and I didn't see and didn't catch, that upset that little girl. And she began whining and protesting. Well, the father leaned over and whispered to her, Whatever he said didn't do much good. She just protested a bit louder. The father spoke to her again, aloud this time, and with more firmness, but still very gentle, and with about the same results. The third time, he asked her not to spoil the breakfast. And he pushed his chair back from the table, and he said something like, All right, mother. Susan, or whatever the girl's name was, and I must have a time out. Oh, no, Daddy, she pleaded. No, we don't need a time out. No, no, Daddy, we don't need a time out. And things went well throughout the breakfast after that. Now, I don't know what a time out meant, but it was very effective. It was obvious those children were being taught, trained, disciplined at home. And it was equally as obvious that that father hadn't left all of it to the mother. This father was correcting his children as he's taught by the Holy Spirit to do. Well, the Scripture says in Hebrews 12 and 9, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Didn't say mothers. Children need correction at times. Our educational system refuses to correct a child. If a child says 2 plus 2 equals 5, he's not to be told that his answer is wrong. You see, there are no rights and wrongs. He's told that a better answer would be 4. And that verse continues saying, we gave them reference. Children need correction. Some things are wrong, and someday they'll admire and appreciate the one who corrected them when they needed correction. One of the saddest examples of a father's failure to discipline or correct his children is that of Eli and his sons, two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, in chapters 2 and 3 of the Old Testament book of 1 Samuel. 
Eli himself was a good man. He served God faithfully as priest among the people, but his sons were disgracefully immoral. Well, the scriptures go so far as to say that they made themselves vile. And he, that is their father, Eli, rest, uh, restrained them not. The consequences constitute the saddest two chapters found in Old Testament history. The failure of this man of God to discipline or correct his sons. Finally, but by no means the least, by being present, father can be the much needed and much sought after role model for his children. Without a godly father, children will find their heroes in the entertainment or sports world or perhaps in the political arena. Too many of these people turn out to be shamefully bad role models, disappointments, bad influences on children. Let's pray. Holy Father, thank Thee for Thy teaching about our fathers, our mothers, uh, their guidance they gave us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we didn't have time to study some other things that father needs to be present in the home to do along with his children so as to bring them up in the nurture and the teaching of the Lord. Sorry about that. We'll try again another time. Fathers, a word of advice from a senior. I have very few regrets about my life spent in the service of the Lord, but there's this one. If I had my life to live over, I'd spend more time with my family. I'd be more a part of their life. But let me leave you with this thought of honoring father and mother. First Timothy 5, 8, there's a statement that should concern Christians more than it does. I don't know that I've ever heard a sermon on it or maybe even preached a sermon on it uh, entirely. As life changes, relationships and responsibilities change also. So it is with the divine charge to honor thy father and mother. 
means one thing in the days of our childhood, still another in adolescence, something else in our adult years. This verse is addressing the need to honor our elderly parents, widows in particular, but not exclusively, I think. And it says, if any man provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel or an unbeliever, a New American Standard Version. When I have heard it taught, the application has been made to a father providing for the necessities of his small children and for his wife. However, when read in its context, it's an obvious reference to caring for elderly and needy adult family members, widows in particular. Please note the entire reading. Rebuke not an elder or older person, but entreat him as a father and the younger men as brethren, the elder women as mothers, the younger as sisters with all purity. Honor widows that are widows indeed. But if any man have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite or to repay their parents, for that is good and acceptable before God. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in the supplications and prayers day and night. But she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth, and these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he has denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under threescore years, old, having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works, if she have brought up children, if she have loosed strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has relieved the uh, afflicted, if she has dil diligently followed every good work. Think about that. Thanks for being with us. If you'd like a free printed copy or an audio cassette tape of this message, please mail your request to In Search of the Lord's Way, Post Office Box 371, Edmond, Oklahoma. Our email address is searchtv at aol.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of us, the toll-free telephone number is 1-800-321-8633. Everything's free. We're presented here with no appeals for money or without selling anything by your friends and neighbors who are members of Churches of Christ. It is our hope, though, that you'll pay a visit to a nearby Church of Christ real soon and investigate our teachings and beliefs in the light of God's Word. Do that, will you? Fathers, make your children... May your children make this day a great one for you. Unless the Lord comes first, we'll be back next Sunday. Hope you will too. God bless. <laughs>